Iran is not Libya. Iran isn't defenseless. Iran has a very strong military and presents an actual challenge right. to <clears throat> invade. Whereas Iraq has a much had a much weaker government. It had a weak dictator. It had a weak security. And they kept buying weapons from us and then we'd say, Oh look, they have weapons. You know, that's one thing that Iran will n- not mess around with. They've never messed with the U.S. as far as, hey, give me some, give me some weapons. No, we've never even helped them at all or anything like that. And they won't play ball with us. And Iraq played ball with us until it didn't suit them to play ball with us anymore. But Iran, we don't have any real stake in. I mean, except for the oil and everything, but. I think this is more of a political issue than a resource issue like Libya was. I think this is more of a Israel issue. Well, yeah. Israel but. acting out of control and yeah. wanting to take everything around them. And just like Max Egan said about the people in Gaza. Right. You know, the people, he was reporting live from Gaza. If you missed that, ladies and gentlemen, you can download that at truthfrequencyradio.com. We did a special broadcast last Wednesday with Max live in Gaza. I don't know how he got in there. Well, I do know how he got in there, but I'm not going to say it until he gets out. <laughs> until he gets out safely. But it, he, you know, the the people there. Nobody wants wants this war. Nobody wants anything. He mentioned that they have all Israeli water and Israeli supplies in the convenience stores. And he asked him, "If you're so against Israel, why, uh, why do you have all this stuff?" And he says, "Well, it's because." And the people answered, "Well, it's because that's all we can get. They have such a a strong hold on the region that that's all that they're able to get." Mm-hmm. And just just like in Palestine, how the Israelis are basically creating the Hamas situation to provide a problem that they have to respond to. Well, that was a question that we raised on the broadcast. Is is Hamas controlled by Israel? Mm-hmm. They could very well be. I think they are. That that It's just par for the course and seeing as how now they're training terrorists that actually you know live in Iran – to take over the Iranian government or to pull false flags in their own country. Oh no, no, no. they're they're trading, they're training freedom fighters. Oh yeah. You have to remember when it's right. something that we want, they're freedom fighters. <laughs> when they're opposing whatever we're doing, and that even goes for people here in the United States who are opposing what the government is doing, then they're terrorists or insurgents or whatever they mm-hmm. try to make them out to be. And Al Qaeda is our friend one minute, and they're our enemy the next. I mean, it's it's just all so silly. Well, I don't blame anybody, not a single soul on this earth, who is fighting for their own land. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter who they're fighting against. If they're fighting for their land, that's the most honorable fight that you can ever put up. Mm-hmm. And no, that doesn't include. Israel's taking of land. No, no, no. <laughs> from other people. Fighting for land and then that saying belongs it's theirs. to you, not land that you claim is yours. <laughs> right. Right. You have a divine right written down thousands of years ago in a very racist book. And, you know, I didn't realize uh, until I was talking to Max uh, uh, the size of these regions. I mean, really, Israel is 15 kilometers. Gaza's 20 kilometers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have nothing better to do than to fight over this little 20 kilometer piece of land. Well, because gods and prophets and all kinds of but you know what it's just there. like just like the alien, the Aryan Brotherhood that I've talked about many times on the show. I was watching the documentary. The two people that are in charge of the Aryan Brotherhood, the biggest white supremacist group in prison, are both Jews. Not yeah. only are they both Jews, but all the higher ranks come out and openly admit, well, this has nothing to do with white power. This has nothing to do with Nazi idealism. This has to do with controlling everything that goes in and out of the prisons. And the white power and all of that is just something to just draw the uh, younger people in and the people who are really enthusiastic about the cause. And I think the same thing goes with these religions. Mm-hmm. They're just there just to draw the, the, the people in the lower ranks in, but the people in the higher ranks, they know that it is all a complete and total fraud to control you. Mm-hmm. 
But anyways, I don't want to keep Samira waiting any more any longer. Samira Sharif, welcome back to the show. Hello. Hello. Uh- Hi, nice to be back on your show again. I do want to say that uh, this time the connection sounds a little bit distorted, so I'm not sure if it's from your side or my end. Okay, but- yeah, that might be um, just our audio feed going into you. Uh, let me see if I can turn that down a little bit. Did, does that sound a little better for you? Um, no, maybe a little bit louder. What happens is it's kind of it's it's just your. Um, it seems like it keeps getting disconnected. Not disconnected, but I'm not hearing you entirely. Let's just um, try it again. That's very strange. Um, I don't know what the problems that we've been having lately, ever since we moved to this new place. The it almost sounds like you guys are uh, on a cellular phone. You know how when there's no reception? That's how, kind of how, what it sounds like. But Really? That, that is very, very odd. Let me let me see if I can make one more adjustment here. Um all right. Does that sound better? It does, yes. Okay, good okay, deal. Great. All right. I switched it up there. You might get a, a, a momentary echo at times, but if you do, just bear with us. Uh, the system automatically corrects itself, but um, when I switch to this particular pipeline, that's what happens. But anyways, what do you think about what's going on um, in Iran right now with all the new developments with um, Netanyahu and, and his shenanigans and the Israeli lobbyists coming out and saying, we need a false flag so we can just go in there and just get it taken care of? Right. As you know, uh, the president, Ahmadinejad, was um, here in New York also. I don't know if you guys heard the speech that he gave to the UN, but he came here and on Tuesday um, there was a speech that I, I listened to the speech carefully. Of course, the translation in English is very different from what he's saying in Farsi. <laughs> right. I, I had a feeling, you know, I was watching some of Gaddafi's speeches and I had a feeling that they weren't quite translating it the right way. I know from personal experience because I watch Greek speakers speak and the translations right. are off. It is, yeah. And uh, so it's not entirely... Um, translated you know what the uh, the way that he's uh speaking but it was very interesting to watch that and and listen to that um and uh what's happening over there is kind of similar to what's happening here that's the interesting part is that the middle class is completely disappearing um this is uh recently i've spoken to a few um of my friends so they're involved in some political stuff that's going on there and uh it's kind of a situation where a lot of the people are afraid of what is you know the propaganda around the war and uh Israel attacking Iran mm-hmm. and um there's a lot of uh civil uh disobedience that goes on at this time but it's not very much still um it seems like people are kind of going into panic mode where they're purchasing they're buying a lot of dollars now oh um, really so yeah it seems as if you know people are the i mean since i spoke to you guys about a month and a half ago the prices have gone even higher than that the price of the dollar well don't and you so think- uh it's difficult even to purchase the dollars now you know they have to purchase it uh sometimes from the black market and so there's been uh, a lot of people who are kind of worried about, you know, what's going to happen. And, and some people are worried that if they purchase and get all this, all these dollars, if it's even going to be worth anything <laughs> in, in a couple of months. Right, exactly. Um, I, do you think that these uh, panic-driven people are kind of just at the whims of the sanctions that we've put on their country lately? And that's what's yes, causing all of the all of the yes, financial. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. this is it's, it's partly related to those sanctions because really it's the people who end up suffering. It's not the government. And, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and another thing is, you know, a lot of times people assume and they think that um, and even especially the youth of today in Iran um, who are very active, they're against the regime, the current regime and. But often, you know, I get, I personally get into debates with, you know, these are Iranian Americans like me who live here. They've lived here all their lives and, um, they are politically aware. But when it comes to conversations like voting and just a lot of things about Iran related to Iran, they still fall under an assumption that, you know, uh, America 
uh, can come and change that situation. And what I try to remind everybody is that the whole revolution that occurred in Iran, this regime that's in Iran now, is a result of what America uh, back at that time, um, you know, like they they backed up uh, not only the Iraq war, the Iran and Iraq war, but, you know, prior to that, Mossadegh, who was uh, really against, uh, you know, the oil going uh, to England. And um, so he actually, you know, fought to get the oil nationalized. And so... That in itself, uh, people seem to forget that. Well, that the regime, the Ayatollah regime, you know, the fundamentalists that are there ruling uh, are a result of um, the U.S. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of the political um, issues that they were involved in with uh, Britain so or England. Well, yeah, I mean, if you just mention Operation Gladio to them, they have no idea what you're talking about. But that was a set of false flag events that we pulled over in Iran uh, to depose Mosaddegh, and the the links that we went to to try to do that was just incredible, and um, it's one of the most embarrassing things that the intelligence community has to admit that we've done false flags in Iran before, and, and now they're about to do it again. We still have not came forward to say yes, you know, to take full full account, you know accountability and responsibility of that. Oh no! Instead, we're we're completely turning it backwards and saying that they're they're bad, they're full of terrorists. We need to go get them. And what I also want to add over here is that um, for quite some time, as you know, you know, uh, those of us who've been um, listening to you know the the war and the propaganda around that, we have known for quite some time that Iran hasn't attacked any country for over a hundred years now. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so what, I mean, you know, the normal person, the normal American um, person that you speak to and they think of Iran, but they don't know all this information that when was the last time that Iran, you know, attacked another country that, so what, what threat is it posing to any of the other countries? It hasn't, you know, and um, it's just it's it's crazy. It's crazy that people don't even, you know, consider any of these facts and they're just going along with whatever the mainstream media is putting in their heads. Is it true that Iran wants at least access to nuclear weapons because of the situation going on with Israel and Palestine? Well, I can tell you for quite some time, I, I believe, uh, that they probably do have, you know, that, I mean, you gotta understand that Iranians, especially, you know, the, there's a generation of, um, there, there are generation of, um, men and women who are, uh, very intelligent, you know, they're very math, uh, mathematical, you know, engineers, a lot of engineers, a oh, lot yeah, of, they're brilliant. you have actually, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna mention they're brilliant, um, if you notice, uh, a lot of the early medical works were by the Arabs and the Persians. Yes, absolutely. And so many of them, you know, they are working, you know, with the government. I mean, we all know that money, obviously, there's power to money. And, you know, they're working for the regime. And so, uh, but I also happen to believe that, you know, like what you and Chris said earlier, you know, that if, if, um, they should have the right to. If America, and why, why should it be that some countries have the right to have nuclear weapons and others don't? When actual, in actuality, they're, they, they should have that in order to defend their land and their people from, you know, uh, nuclear attacks. So I, I, you know, happen to believe that. Um, they probably have developed it, you know, um, now have they, uh, do they have intentions of using it? Probably not unless, you know, there's a, a full on war going on where, you know, they need to protect their people and the land. And so I don't see what, you know, what is the problem? Why, why should another country have it and not Iran? Exactly. I, I completely agree with you. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere. We've just gotten started.
Is your privacy important to you? Is having all of your assets well organized one of your priorities? Do you wonder if your business and personal estate will be protected for your family and not taken away by government bureaucracies? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then now's the time to find out about Freedom Bound International's Pure Trust. A Pure Trust organization is protected by the Constitution and is not subject to government regulation. Property held in a Pure Trust is free from liens, levies, or other actions filed against you. You can find out more about Freedom Bound International's Pure Trust and schedule a trust consultation simply by calling toll-free 1-888-385-FREE. That's 888-385-3733 or log on to www.freedomradio.us. Call us now for information and to schedule a trust consultation. 888-385-FREE. That's 888-385-3733 or online at www.freedomradio.us. Did you know that the blue lotus flower was used by the ancient Egyptians as an aphrodisiac to experience feelings of euphoria and ecstasy? And ecstasy? And ecstasy? Did you know that Thai Kratom was used by the Buddhist monks to produce a relaxing and dreamlike state? Did you know San Pedro Cactus was used by the Native Americans to quest for visions and heal the body? Bouncing Bear Botanicals is your number one supplier of rare and sacred plants and a proud sponsor of Truth Frequency Radio. By clicking on the banner at truthfrequencyradio.com, you can learn more about a vast selection of entheogens, including Amanita muscaria, also known as the sacred mushroom. So click on the banner at truthfrequencyradio.com, and you'll also get up to $40 off your next order. Never. Has there been a time where the collective human consciousness has so reverently contemplated who we truly are, where we come from, what we are doing here, and where we are headed? Our Universal Journey is a book that answers the call, revealing life's biggest concepts and delivering this complex knowledge in a way that is simplistic and understandable, like a great and beautiful secret we all already know. The official launch date for our Universal Journey is the 22nd of September. We have an incredible offer for the launch if you purchase the paperback through Amazon on the official launch date of the 22nd of September, you will receive a free download of the audiobook, which is 10 hours in duration. That's the free download of the audiobook, Our Universal Journey. You know, a lot of these people we go after, we like to label as terrorists or working with terrorists. A lot of people don't realize, but Gaddafi was the first one to alert the United Nations and the West about bin Laden's whereabouts. Yet we say that al-Qaeda was in Libya. Being harbored by Being Gaddafi. harbored by Gaddafi. Saddam Hussein mustered gas the village because they were... Hiding Al-Qaeda. And then we put him on trial for it and said that he's the terrorist. Samira, what is the view on quote-unquote terrorism in Iran? Um, can you repeat that once again? What is the... What is the view? Well, I mean, what the are the... view how, on yeah. terrorism. Okay. Yeah. The view on terrorism in Iran. Um, well, uh, I think that a lot of Iranians, generally speaking, have suffered uh, consequences of, you know, the mislabeling. Um, I myself, even during the time that I came uh, to United States of America during my junior year of high school, I had already talked to not only my parents, but a lot of other family members who had kind of warned me that 
Um, you know, I, I might be bullied in school that people might label me. And so when I actually started high school, uh, junior year, I was quite prepared for, you know, being bullied. And it actually, on the very first day of school that I attended high school, uh, I was approached by a few people in the classroom who were kind of, um, you know, trying to intimidate me. And, and so they approached me saying that, are you a terrorist? And at that time, I had already prepared, the, uh, the you know, what I was going to respond to that sort of a thing. And so till this day, I think that a lot of uh, Iranians are uh, upset about, you know, this mislabeling. And they uh, often fear that when, you know, they are in, in other parts of the world that this uh, mislabeling kind of, it just, uh, it seems to be a very common thing that is um, really, it's sad, actually. It's its pretty sad. So I think that we need to really shift the way that people think. And as you know, the way to do that is through education and media, because right now there's just not enough on the mainstream news. It's its not enough. What people are seeing is, is an image of, you know, terrorists and terrorism and that sort of thing. And what, what really concerns me right now in that country is it's not actually the threat, the outside threat, but, but what concerns me is that people are so fed up with the regime there. As you know, the population is, um, most of the population in Iran are, uh, consists of youth, uh, under the age of 30. And so they are very suppressed. You know, there's, there's a lot of suppression and oppression that's been going on for years. And uh, so they are desperate. They're at a point where they are very desperate and they're looking for, you know, any any way out of that regime. And so here's where the revolutionary guards come in the, or the freedom, you know, the as you said, the false flag people, uh, the false that, flag people. That is perfect. It, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And so the false, you know, the freedom fighters. And I think that. Here's where it really, um, sh- you know, it, it's, it's, it should be a concern, you know, for us that we have family members there and we're worried that um, something's going to happen internally. And that, then when that happens internally, it's going to be easy for, you know, Israel and America to just come in and take over. And um, Well, absolutely. That's what we saw in Libya. We saw um, Israel hired 50,000 mercenaries. And the cover story for this was that they were going to go quell the protests that were happening, the uprising against Gaddafi, and because Gaddafi refused to do anything about it. But then on the other side of their mouth, they were saying that he was killing his own people. So they were going to quell the uprising. In actuality, it was these mercenaries that Israel hired that started all of the havoc and were creating all of the violence. And there were even videos out there of uh, the mainstream media getting a group of people and then urging them to act like they're protesting and to put on this big show. And uh, people were filming this from behind the scenes, and they put those behind-the-scenes videos up there. Total, total propaganda. But I, I can definitely see something like that happening in Iran. And if you follow the money trail, it all goes back to the National, Demo- the National Endowment of Democracy. Uh, which is funded right here out of the United States. It's supposedly a, a private organization, but the front men are George Bush, John McCain, and the usual suspects. Yeah, and what I see is that, you know, people, um, they just, they, they, they assume that, okay, well, um, you can, you know, there's a black market in Iran, you can find anything there, which is true uh, up to a certain point. There is a black market there where, you know, you can, find anything from, you know, legal drugs to dollars to all sorts, you know, videos, music, all of that stuff that is illegal by law. But however, one thing is that as far as arms and guns and weapons, that that's something that is has never been accessible even in the black market to people, c- civilians. So, you know, you would know for sure that if you see, I mean, if I hear something on the news or, you know, know that, Okay, there's people have weapons. You know that that's being funded by somewhere outside. You know right. that um, it's it's just obvious because you know that's been part of the problem why people haven't been able to uprise against the regime 
um, you know, is not having anything to defend themselves. You have to dis- what- yeah, you have to disarm the population. That's what they're yeah. trying to do here in the States. And that's why the UN is so afraid of the people here in the United States with guns, because they know they can't move their agenda forward when they have opposition like that. But you raised some, some interesting questions, at least in my mind. Um, you said uh, things uh, are available on the black market, but there's things like music and movies and things like that that aren't that that have been outlawed what is the regime like in iran and uh, as far as the totalitarian totalitarity of the situation um what type of music and books and things like that would be banned um anything actually you know the uh, anything any western music has for a long time ever since uh you know the regime uh the revolution that is uh, that all Western music became uh, against the law. You know, all, they burned down all the bars and the pot pubs, you know, and alcohol is illegal over there. There's, um, And it's an interesting story um, because people often, you know, there's, there's um, um, uh, obviously a, a different approach. Every person, every individual has a different view of what freedom means and what freedom really is. So I myself was back at that time in the position, you know, when you're young, you want to listen to music, you know, you want to um, go out to parties, you want to be able to hold hands with, you know, a boyfriend if that's, you know, I mean, these are natural stuff that happens and all these, these were outlawed and against the law. So, you know, there's a severe punishment that comes with that. For example, if they... Uh, people, you know, they do throw underground parties and, you know, there's all kinds of music that's coming in all the time. And so that's shifted over the past 10 years since I've been gone. A lot of the hip hop culture has taken over. Um, and so uh, that's kind of changed. Uh, you know, as we see over here, the music has changed from from the time of the 60s. Right, you know, on. right. We've seen music, which we, you know, we have a good understanding of that because music does change your consciousness and, um, you know, it affects your mood and, and those lyrics are important. What's being put, you know, in, in the songs and what's being fed to the youth. And so, um, one of the sad, uh, scenarios that's, that's happening right now is street drugs. For example, there, you know, back at that time when I was there, um, you know, you would find a lot of opium. That's, you know, Afghanistan is right there. And it's very common, actually, for people to use that. Some doctors would even prescribe it to patients. And uh, over the course of the last 10 years, this has changed. So now you're finding more of the really uh, hardcore, you know, like there's speed and just crack and a lot of that stuff, which um, a lot of the youth there are... Um, you know, addicted to this sort of thing. And so it's it's kind of an internal mess, you could say. Well, it seems to be a worldwide problem, though. I mean, we've got the exact same thing going on mm-hmm. here. I was just talking to some random person the other day, and she was telling me that her boyfriend's on heroin and trying to get off. And then I met somebody at the grocery store, and he was actually the guy behind the counter. And I just looked at him and said, well, you had a pretty wild night last night, didn't you? And he says, oh, man, why do I look like it? And then he, he opened up a little bit and he told me he was trying to get off heroin. Uh, it's it's, it's an epidemic everywhere. Well, here's the interesting thing is that uh, everything from the West uh, that goes, you know, through satellite. They have satellites in Iran. People, you know, then there's Internet and satellite TV where they can watch, you know, CNN and all the MTV and that sort of thing. And so... Um, you know, the culture there has changed just like a lot of other cultures around the world that have been influenced by the Western culture. And uh, it's really sad for me to actually witness that. Now, back at that time when I was a teenager, you know, I had different views. Uh, once I came here and, you know, I, ha- I, I gave birth to my son, it really changed my life. That was my first initial awakening point of, you know, understanding that, wow, I'm, I'm responsible for this other life form here. And so my views have really changed. I don't consider the freedom of, you know, like um, before hijab used to be an, an issue for me. I wanted to leave the country just so I wouldn't have to wear the hijab. I wouldn't have to cover my hair just so, you know, I could go to a party. And so I don't have these same views now. And what I look at right now is that more of my freedom is jeopardized here in the United States of America because here I'm having to worry about all sorts of stuff. 
and like what is being put in the food that I'm giving to my son, mm-hmm. what put in his brain, you know, in school, um, as we talked about it before. And none of these things were a concern, you know, like in Iran, we, we used to eat healthy food, you know, everything was organic. We didn't have to worry about fluoride in our water. So, you know, here is the, the question, you know, uh, is what does freedom mean to everybody? And, you know, um, the whole sovereignty thing comes into question. And, you know, because uh, you could be in prison and you could be the freest person. You know, you could be literally behind bars and yet in your heart be the freest person. So these are all questions, you know, that that need to be defined by people. And, you know, especially in this critical time right now where um, everything seems to be collapsing, you know. I think it was I a... Like, sh- oh, go ahead. I, I just... No, go ahead. You can finish. And after you're done, I would like to then um, just read a, a small paragraph, which is uh, written from uh, famous author John Taylor Gatto, who was a school teacher, a New York State school teacher. But you can go ahead, Chris. Um, I'll read oh, no, that. no, no. Take us away. Okay. Uh, I'll read this for you. <clears throat> he says, now, this is a very interesting book. Uh, it was published in 1992, and I'll read it for you. Whatever an education is, it should make you a unique individual, not a conformist. It should furnish you with an original spirit with which to tackle the big challenges. It should allow you to find values which will be your roadmap through life. It should make you spiritually rich, a person who loves whatever you are doing, wherever you are, whomever you are with. It should teach you what is important, how to live and how to die. What's gone in the way of education in the United States is a theory of social engineering that says there is no one right way to proceed with growing up. This is an ancient Egyptian idea symbolized by the pyramid with an eye on top that's on the other side of George Washington's uh, $1 bill. Everyone is a stone defined by a position on the pyramid. This theory has been presented in many different ways, but at bottom it signals the worldview of minds obsessed with the control of other minds, obsessed by dominance and strategies of intervention to maintain that dominance. Schools, I hear is argued would make better sense and be better value as 9 to 5 operations or even 9 to 9. This new world order schooling would serve dinner, provide evening recreation, offer therapy, medical attention, and a whole range of other services, which convert the institution into a true synthetic family for children, better than the original one for many poor kids, it is said. Yet, it appears to me as a school teacher that schools are already a major cause of weak families and weak communities. They separate parents and children from vital interaction with each other and from true curiosity about each other's lives. Schools stifle family originality by appropriating the critical time needed for any sound idea of family to develop. So I just wanted to read that because I think that even though that was in the year 1992, it applies to our current situation. You're absolutely right. And one thing that you said earlier is that the people, the kids, the youth in Iran, um, they still get the CNN, the MTV and all that stuff. And the first thing that I thought to myself, oh, good, they get their daily dose of brainwashing. They do. They do. You know, I mean, even we're talking about recently, two days ago, I talked to one of my friends, you know, behind um, the Internet, Sohrab, and he told me that uh, I asked him, you know, to kind of tell me what, what's the situation among the youth. And he said, for example, that we have 19, 20, 21 year olds that are doing plastic surgery that are making themselves, you know, look like these, these model pictures that they are seeing on, you know, the satellite or in magazine, you know, the covers of magazine. Um, so it's, it's very sad to see that, you know, that sort of thing, they're being brainwashed, you know, by an outside, um, uh, Influence. propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> And so they're spending, you know, even though they're not doing well economically, yet he was telling me that they're somehow managing to find money to do these, you know, like uh, surgical <laughs> implants and all kinds of, you know, like um, uh, just, you know, noses and, you know, like um, injections in their lips and all, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's just it's scary. It's very scary. 
Wow. Well, they approve it for girls as young as 12 or 13 here. I, I, I didn't know that recently, you know, after talking to this person, I realized, wow, yeah, it seems like, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it is common here from an early age. Um, we just don't hear about it as much, but, um, I think that, you know, that's something that needs to shift. I mean, obviously the media has a big, big role in this. You know, if you look at the child, um, any child, any individual child uh, who's influenced, you know, obviously we know first comes the home and neighborhood family. The second is the school, education, and media. And these two are very important. You know, they are giving the information to these kids about the world around them. And so if it's some sort of fake or, you know, superficial kind of images that are coming through the media into youth, then, you know, that's going to influence how they perceive themselves and how they perceive the world around them. Well, and if it, if if getting a nose job is this big of a deal to these girls, then I kind of wonder what's going to happen when, let's say, the West starts putting out things specifically for Iranian people that say, yeah, you need to just take over the government. The government sucks, you know, or something like that. You know, they just might do it. I mean, seeing as how their their standards of of idealism are are so out of control. I mean, what do you think? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is you know, it's uh, it it really feels to me like that you know we're going to be dealing with a bigger crisis if anything happens in Iran. And so I'm trying to do whatever that I can on, you know, on do, doing my part in um, getting the word out there and talking about Iran uh, to people. You know, I used to five years ago, you know, I used to be um, a little self-conscious about just going to people and telling them I'm from Iran. And now I'm at the point where it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I am proud of my uh, cultural heritage and, and I'm even, you know, extremely appreciative of the experiences, even the negative experiences that I had in Iran, because it's really helped me, you know, be this person that I am now and uh, to, you know, live my life uh, uh, truthfully, truth, truth to myself and, you know, spread the word to people so that they are aware and they know what's really happening. Um, and then I also uh, want to. I, you know, I want to have the opportunity here to very briefly, uh, just kind of go over the timeline of, uh, the education system here, the public schooling in America, uh, uh, going by date. So I don't know if that's something that, um, you guys are, uh, ready for. Yes. Take us away on that. Definitely. I'm just going to do it very briefly, you know, and, uh, just kind of so you guys can get the feel of, and the listeners, of course, can get the feel of these changes, how they, how they, ha- how they've happened throughout our history. So as we know, in 1635 was the first public school in Boston in the United States of America. And, uh, from the 1840s, uh, things start to change. I'm not going to go beyond, before the 1840s, but I'm going to start with, 1852, which was the Massachusetts, which passes the first mandatory uh, attendance law for compulsory schooling, uh, which is mandated schooling. And actually, not, not many people know this, that uh, a lot of the Massachusetts families at that time were against that. And they were the many of the children were escorted with the militia. <laughs> How does that sound for your first day of school? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but um, from 1852, that that was the first mandatory attendance law. And you see a jump from 1852 to 1902, or I think 1903, uh, when John uh, D. Rockefeller creates the General Education Fund. Now we're talking 1902, 1903, $129 million is a lot of money back at that time that was put towards, you know, the General Education Fund. And uh, that money basically was, you know, it provided major, major funding for, you know, all kinds of, um, for all the schools, not just schools, but colleges and whatnot. And uh, from two, you know, two, three years later, about 1905, uh, we see that there's the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching that was established. 
And then again, we see from 1905 to 1914, we see that uh, in 1914, the National Education Association, um, that was established. And uh, so here slowly it changes to 1917, um, that the NEA, which is short for National Education Association, they reorganize everything and they, they move to Washington, D.C. And then you see that by 1918, every single state and in the United States of America requires that students have to complete the elementary, you know, school. And then again, there's, uh, there's about 20 years jump. There's 1932. You see that, uh, there's la- la- largely um, funded um, Carnegie Corporation of New York comes and uh, so they start to lay the foundation for the education reform. By 1979 we have the U.S. Department of Education uh, which you know that that the, the Department of Education itself is just and you know it's an approach to in- indoctrinate uh, children with a lot of antisocial ideas, and it's really a social engineering project at this point. And so I just wanted to kind of, you know, bring that from the 18, you know, 40s or the 18, you know, 50s up to the 1979 and 80s and uh, see that, you know, these major things have happened and where the funding is coming from, because you could track everything back through money, as you know. A while while ago, somebody posted um, some of the exams and they were middle school level exams uh, from the 1800s, and it had college level questioning yeah. in it. And it, the way that the education system has been dumbed down and dumbed down and dumbed down. But not only that, they don't teach you anything. If you if you think critically, then you actually fail. If you don't repeat. Uh, what they tell you, you fail. If you think of the, if, for instance, a, a situation with me when I was in school, they were teaching us math and we were supposed to show our work. Well, I came to the right answer to the problem without going the long way that they were telling me to go. But because I didn't do exactly what they told me, they gave me all of the questions wrong and I failed the test. And this is one of the differences that I want to, um, I want to mention here is that from my two schooling experiences, the major difference that I personally have experienced is that uh, something was different about when when we were in school in Iran. It's it seemed as though all the students they we were kind of aware we knew that what the agenda of the public schools were without actually you know without. Without anybody sitting us down and telling us, you know, that, that, that we all kind of had this inner knowledge of, okay, well, the regime has changed and we have to kind of, you know, we don't have any choice. We have to go to school. You know, we have to respond to those questions and the tests and all of that, you know. And, and so every government, it doesn't really matter where, what country, but, you know, education and the schools are so tied into the government and um, their political system. You know, it has to support the political system at the time. And so most of us knew this from the time that we were going in school. We knew that, okay, you know, we just got to memorize all this stuff. And it's not really how the history is. It's not really what's happened. They've changed all the books. (laughs) And uh, the difference I experienced here is that people here are completely oblivious. They don't, they have no idea. They don't, they don't know this. They don't know what the agenda of the schooling is. And, uh, you know, so whatever that's being, you know, fed to the kids and, and books, I mean, in the history lessons or, you know, there are people, that's the knowledge that, you know, we see that most people have now as adults. And so that's a fascinating thing for me is that how, how is it that, you know, as, as people going, I mean, as, as children going to school, you know, in the Iranian school system, we kind of, there, there wasn't this division amongst us, uh, you know, going to the, us, the students going to schools. We kind of had this agreement. We knew, okay, we have to get through this. And yeah, it's all, you know, a load of, um, nonsense that they're feeding us. And that's just how it is. But here it's, the agenda has been different and you can see that in how people respond, how much they, they know about the world around them, you know, and, and the information that they have about their government. You're absolutely right. I want to get more into that in the final hour. On the other side, we're about to hit a break. Uh, Samira, give us your websites really quick. Hey. 
you can find us on Facebook as well. Um, please do uh, comment if, or ask us any questions if you'd like. Give it, give us the website one more time. You cut out a little bit. Ask Tribe. All right. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, right here on Truth Frequency. <laughs> 